Good day, Eco231 students. We are in week 5 already. We will continue with chapter 4, sections 4.3, 4.4 and 4.5 respectively. Please take note that section 4.6 is not prescribed. Now, in section 4.1 of this chapter, you dealt with individual demand. We now will look at market demand and how it is derived. Now, market demand can be defined as a curve relating to the quantity of a good that all consumers in a market are willing to buy at its price. Now, we're going to look at a table this is table 4.2 from the textbook and it shows you an example where you have three individual consumers and this is the market for coffee now we can see we've got three individual consumers individual a individual b and individual c and we can also see that there are various prices ranging from one dollar to five dollar for this market um, of coffee right so with those given in prices from one dollar to five dollar the individual quantity demanded for each consumer respectively can be seen by columns two three and four so this tells you how many units or the quantity demanded by individual a at the respective prices for coffee so if we have a look at Column five, for instance, here we've got the market demand. Now to obtain these values, this was obtained by getting the horizontal summation or adding the units of individual A, individual B and individual C at a price of $1. So six plus 10 is 16 plus 16 is 32. So the market demand at the price of $1 is going to be 32 units. If we have a look at when the price is $4 for coffee, then the market demand is going to be 11 units. Individual A demands zero units at $4. However, individual B will demand four units and individual C seven units so that gives us a cumulative total of 11 units being the market demand at the price of four dollars and again you can do that for the other prices at now in figure 10 it's going to show us the three individual demand curves for consumer A consumer B and consumer C and that is demand curve a for consumer A, demand curve for consumer B, and the demand curve C for consumer C. Now, in order to get the market demand curve, it is the horizontal summation of these three individual demand curves. So, adding these three demand curves, a, B, and C for those individual consumers will give you your market demand curve for coffee. So if we have a look at the total quantity at any given price, as I showed you in the previous example, when the price of coffee was $4, in the table you saw that the market demand was going to be 11 units. And how was that obtained? It was obtained by seeing that at a price of $4, consumer A or individual A had a quantity demanded of zero. Then at a price of $4, $4, consumer B, individual B, had a quantity demanded at that price of four units. And then your individual C, you can see that's demand curve C for that individual, had a quantity demanded of seven units at a price of $4. So in order to get the 11 units, which was the market demand at a price of four dollars it is the addition or the horizontal summation of those 
individual consumers demand at that particular price and that will give you your market demand so also notice that your demand curves are all downward sloping as you would expect it to be and that your market demand curve is also downward sloping however it is kinked at that point and that corresponds to this point over here where this individual a at a price of four dollars demanded zero so that is why that kink rises over there because a price above that any price above four dollars consumer individual a would demand nothing two points need to be taken note of the first point is that the market demand curve will shift to the right as more consumers enter the market because that would increase the market demand and also factors that influence the demands of many consumers will also affect the demand curve so for instance the market demand so for instance if you think about income as a factor if it affects many consumers it will also affect the market demand curve so please do take note of those two points and then lastly the aggregation of individual demands into a market becomes very useful in practice when market demands are built up of those demands of different demographic groups or consumers located in different areas. So let's think about an application here. For instance, if we were to think about the total demand for a product such as wheat, it could be given by the demand of the domestic demand as well as the export or foreign demand and that makes up the total demand so in a similar way you could look at the market demand or total demand for a particular product and see how that can be built up of individual demands be it based on demographic factors or regions etc next we're going to move on to the elasticity of demand now from first year microeconomics you and you could also recall from chapter two you know that the price elasticity of demand is given by the percentage change in your quantity demanded if the price increases by one percent now here we'll obviously use q to represent quantity and p represents price you have the following formula given by 4.1 so EP, that is your um, elasticity coefficient, right? So in this following formula, your change in Q over Q is that percentage change in the quantity. And of course, this represents the percentage change in price. And we know that that triangle represents delta or change in a given quantity. And then this can obviously be expanded to your price over quantity at a point if you're using the point formula times your change over change of q over the change in p and that is your elasticity of demand formula now you will recall that if demand is inelastic the price elasticity of demand that elasticity coefficient for your price elasticity of demand is going to be less than one. Remember, we interpret it in absolute terms. Of course, your value is negative um, because of the relationship between quantity demanded and price. But in absolute terms, if it is smaller than one, that price elasticity of demand coefficient, it tells you that it's relatively inelastic. So the quantity demanded is relatively unresponsive if price changes. So if price increases, you'll find that the quantity demanded doesn't change that much. Hence, expenditure on a particular product will still increase. Now, the opposite is going to be true for elastic demand. Here, your elasticity coefficient is bigger than one in absolute terms. So it means that the quantity demanded is going to be quite responsive to changes in price. So if price increases, the effect on quantity demanded is even greater in the opposite direction. That is, your quantity demanded falls, and hence the expenditure on the product is also going to decrease if it is elastic demand. 
Now, isoelastic demand, that term you may not have encountered just yet, but you will see in a moment that you are familiar with the concept. Now, remember that when your price elasticity of demand is one in absolute terms, we called it unitary or unit elastic demand. So bear that in mind quickly. Now, an isoelastic demand curve is a demand curve where the price elasticity of demand is constant. If you have a look at this particular curve. So remember from chapter two, your linear demand curve or state line demand curve had a constant slope, right? But all along the linear curve, the elasticity coefficient varied. Now, if you have a look at this figure 4.11, you have a convex shaped demand curve, not linear, not a straight line. Here the slope is varied all along the curve, but very importantly in this figure, it has a constant price elasticity. So you should also remember the shape of your unit elastic demand curve from first year micro. Now with unit elastic coefficient, it is equal to minus one or in absolute terms one. So in this case, in this figure, the demand curve has a constant price elasticity coefficient. Think about it. Have a look at the shape. And the price elasticity of demand is minus 1 at every price. So while the slope is changing, the price elasticity is equal to minus 1 all along the curve. So yes, when price increases, Quantity demanded is going to fall, but the net effect on total expenditure is going to remain the same. Or if you were to think about it from the seller's perspective, total revenue remains unchanged in this scenario. Now, table 4.3 is a summary of elasticity and expenditure. Now, this table is useful to understand. If, if you think about it from the perspective of a producer or a seller of a good, if that person knew something about the demand, and let's say they knew that the demand for good is inelastic, it means that if they were to increase their price, yes, the quantity demanded they know would fall but because of that inverse relationship, but because it is relatively inelastic, that fall in quantity demanded is smaller than the increase in price. So for that producer or seller to determine their total revenue as the price times the quantity, their total revenue would still increase. So it is important to understand the usefulness of understanding um, elasticity if it's relatively elastic or inelastic even from a producer's perspective. Now let's quickly turn our attention to speculative demand. So what does speculative demand or speculating mean? So when an individual speculates, it's often because they want to make some profit or gains from a particular situation. So let's say you anticipate that the price of a particular stock or share value is going to increase in the future you would want to purchase it now while it is deemed cheaper so that you can resell it in the future at some higher price to make a profit. So your speculative demand is not based on that satisfaction you actually get from consuming something, but rather it is based on the belief that the price is going to, do, going to rise and as a result of that you can make some sort of gain. So I'm going to stop here and continue part two with the example.